Yep, already. Awesome. I'd like to call this special assembly committee on housing and homelessness meeting to order. We are noticed today from 2 to 3 p.m. Although I will ask to extend the time of this meeting until we hear from everyone in attendance who wants to be heard. Let's go ahead and start with introductions on the dais, please. Starting with Mr. Boland. Daniel Boland. Christopher Foster. Felix Rivera. Cameron Perez Rian. Randy Sold. And then I believe we have Mr. Peterson on the phone. Yes, this is Pete Peterson. Great. Do we have any other members on the phone? Okay, doesn't sound like it. All right. Uh, if we can go ahead and get the presentation up, please. Thank you. All right, welcome everyone to this special housing and homelessness committee meeting. Thank you to the mayor, members of the administration, my colleagues, and of course the public for attending this Sunday meeting. Next slide, please. Okay. Want to know for the record that we've been joined by Ms. France. We are going to start today's meeting with a short presentation so that everyone can get on the same page and understand the decisions we need to make tomorrow. After that, we will move on to listening to members of the public on the emergency shelter plan that came out of this committee last week. I think it's important to have a basic understanding of the situation we are in and the timeline that led us to this meeting today and the one we have tomorrow. I make no political commentary with this timeline, just the facts. Although we could begin the timeline much earlier than June of 2022 and include other key points beyond what I have included, this condensed timeline sufficiently tells the story and keeps this meeting in a solutions-oriented and collaborative space. Next slide, please. So this version of the story begins on June 2nd, when the mayor announced the closure of the Solar Arena as a COVID-19 mass care site. On June 24th, the assembly received an email notification from the municipal manager regarding Centennial Park Campground, which was the first official communication regarding the change in status at Centennial. On July 12th, three assembly members, Mr. Perez Rodia, Mr. Boland, and myself, put forward a five-pronged plan to address what we dubbed as a humanitarian crisis on our streets. The assembly approved four of the components of this plan on July 26th, most relevant, the assembly approved forward funding of for both family and single adult emergency shelter. One of the provisions of what the assembly approved on July 26 required the administration to present their emergency, emergency shelter plan to the Housing and Homelessness Committee on August 17th. Next slide, please. When the administration did not meet this requirement, that same day, the Assembly approved a resolution creating the Emergency Shelter Task Force and set the deadline of September 21 for the task force to come up with preliminary recommendations for review at the Housing and Homelessness Committee. The task force would be convened by the Anchor Coalition to End Homelessness, and members of the administration were required to be invited to the meetings, a requirement which was met at the first meeting of the task force on August 22nd and all future task force meetings. On August 31st, the administration released its emergency shelter plan. The assembly reviewed the administration's plan on September 7th, a day after the task force began its outreach on the initial properties under consideration in their plan, which at the time were the Alex Hotel, Arctic Recreation Center, former Bear Inn, former Benson DMV, the old Sherman Williams, and America's Best Value Inn. This list changed on a weekly, if not daily, basis. Next slide, please. On September 9th, I sent a letter to the task force requesting they consider the Golden Lion in lieu of using the Spinard and Fairview Rec Centers. On September 14th, the task force achieved consensus on Tier 1 recommendations, which are properties that can be turned on by October 1st. The task force released a written report on the preliminary recommendations to the Assembly and Administration on September 16th. That same day, the task force began its outreach efforts focused on two of the recommendations in the report, the former Golden Lion and the Dempsey. On September 21st, 
The Assembly's Housing and Homelessness Committee reviewed the task force preliminary recommendations and then went through a process to determine which facilities that can be turned on by October 1st would be part of the emergency shelter plan we have before us today. Next slide, please. There are two prime reasons why October 1st is such a pivotal deadline for phase one of this work. First, it is getting colder every night, and legally, the municipality must provide emergency shelter. And two, Centennial Park Campground will be closing on September 30th. So, while we could spend all of our time today and tomorrow talking about the Navigation Center, the portable buildings, Northway Mall, or any of the other ideas we've heard, none of these possibilities are viable to meet the impending deadline of October 1. The only viable options are MOA-owned facilities and expansion of current existing facilities. Next slide, please. We'll start with the review of the administration's plan, which had four options. Option A was the portable self-contained buildings. We learned on September 7th that the buildings would not be online until November at the earliest. That changed just last Friday at a work session on a Title 23 ordinance related to the portables, with this option not being viable until the winter of 2023-2024. Option B are the microgrants, with one parent application. We learned on September 21st that this option will likely not be ready by October 1. Option C is the Navigation Center, which on September 7th, we learned, would not be available for partial occupancy until November. Option D, the Spinard and Fairview Rec Centers, were, res were rescinded by the mayor on September 13th. Next slide, please. That takes us to the Emergency Shelter Task Force. This slide shows the many options presented to the Assembly of Tier 1 possibilities. As a reminder, Tier 1 options are those that can be turned on by October 1. These options included the Golden Mine, Dempsey or Bogey Ice Arenas, Sullivan Arena, Denia or Egan Centers, Spinard and Fairview, Fairview Recreation Centers, and expanding the existing program capacity. Next slide, please. The task force narrowed that list down to their official recommendations, which can meet the need of sheltering 350 unsheltered individuals, which included the Golden Lion, the Ice Arena, and expanding capacity at Brother Francis Shelter, Government House, and the new Beans Cafe location in Midtown. Next slide, please. One of the things uh, we did get a chance to discuss last week was what happens after October 1. As you've already seen, most of the mayor's emergency shelter plan fits in this category, and I won't go over that again. Next slide, please. In addition to the title, excuse me, the Tier 1 menu and recommendations, the task force also released the Tier 2 menu, which are all options which can be turned on within 90 days. These include the Arctic Recreation Center, Alex Hotel, former Alaska Native Charter School, former GCI Hall Center, Salvation Army Gym, former DMV on Benson, and other hotel master leases and conversions for housing. The task force will continue to explore these options, which is important as you'll see on the next slides. Next slide, please. Tomorrow, at the special meeting, the assembly will be considering the plan the Housing and Homelessness Committee came up with on September 21. Part of the plan increases capacity at current facilities, so include increased capacity at Brother Francis Shelter of 20 individuals, increased capacity at Covenant House of 25 individuals, and semi congregate sheltering at Beans Cafe's new mid not midtown location of 40 individuals. Next slide, please. In addition, the plan includes using two MOA owned facilities to finish meeting the goal of sheltering 350 unsheltered individuals. That includes using the former Golden Mine as housing of 120 individuals and congregate sheltering at the Sullivan Arena of 150 individuals. On Monday, the body will be presented with a resolution that will require the Sullivan Arena to be the first facility to be demobilized once enough Tier 2 or administration options come online. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pause from the presentation uh, because the, uh, I got a request to speak a little bit about different types of sheltering and housing. So you have likely, you've seen in the presentation, me talk about congregate, not congregate, semi-congregate, and housing. So as folks uh, may know, congregate uh, sheltering 
you know, are spaces like the Solo Bin Arena or regular transit shelter, where you are in a large space and there is little to no privacy. Non-congregate sheltering, uh, one example of that currently is the, the former Sanai Inn, which is operating as a complex care shelter, where individuals do have privacy in their own rooms, but it is a shelter and it is operated as a shelter. Semi-congregate is actually a new term to me, but I assume that it means a mix of the two, a mix of non-congregate and congregate sheltering, and that will be what means cafe will be bringing online. And I'm excited to learn more about that. And then of course we have housing, and one recent example of that is the guest house. So as folks uh, maybe saw in the news recently, the guest house is open as a housing facility in downtown, and that is very different the way it is operated from a non-congregate sheltering facility. All right, back to the presentation. Next slide, please. So before we start testimony today, I just wanted to get a sense of the room. We were able to achieve this last week at the committee meeting with fairly resounding support for the plan. I will invite members of the public to either raise your hands and if you'd like, verbalize your support of the statement after I read it. And we'll go to the next slide in a second where we'll be able to see the statement. We, were, we will repeat this exercise tomorrow as we finish hearing from the public before we get into deliberations and hear from the mayor and the entire assembly. Next slide, please. Okay, so there's four statements. Uh, so I will read each one and allow members of the public to either raise their hands or more verbalize your support of the statement. So to begin, uh, first statement, you support all parts of the plan. Thank you. You support some parts of the plan. Thank you. You don't support use of the former Golden Lion. Thank you. You don't support use of the solar energy. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone for helping to us to get a quick sense of the room. Next slide, please. Again, thanks to everyone for coming today and participating through this process. A big thanks to the administration and members of the task force for coming with ideas regardless of how controversial they may be. As I have said before, I appreciate anyone willing to put themselves out there on this topic. As folks know, the Assembly will be meeting tomorrow at a special meeting of the Assembly scheduled for Monday, September 26th from 6 to 8 p.m. in these chambers, where I hope we will be able to hear once again from the public and vote and approve some version of the plan for emergency sheltering beginning on October 1. With that, let's... <laughs> yes, Mr. Constant. All right, so um, I do have a list of individuals who have signed up. Um, just as a reminder, part of the reason for this meeting was as an accommodation for folks who could not attend the meeting tomorrow on Monday. So I'll go through the list and I will uh, ask for folks, uh, if you can attend tomorrow, the, to just wait until then, or maybe uh, let other folks speak first, and then you can either speak after we're done today or come back tomorrow to speak. So whichever you prefer, I just would like to say that we did create this as a special accommodation. Okay, so with that, let's take down the presentation. We'll switch over to hearing from the public. Each individual will have three minutes. Uh, please begin by stating your name for the record. I'm going to ask members of the public to avoid disrupting the meetings while we hear from individuals. We want to clearly hear what everyone has to say. And the more clapping and noise in between speakers, the longer we will be here today. I'd like you all to get out of here as soon as possible so you can enjoy the rest of your Sunday. So let's begin. I'm going to call three folks at a time. Uh, starting with Jean Carey, Annalise 
Harry and Brian Gross. Welcome. Uh, my name is. I think you can turn the mic on, please. It should be the green button, I believe. There you go. Am I on now? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Assemblyman Rivera. I did have a chance to speak at our last meeting, and I am concerned that um, you're only having people speak at first um, who can't attend on Monday. I'm hoping that we can hear from everyone. Part of the problem that we're facing is pointing fingers and and kind of silos of information. And I I I belong to a lot of different segments of the community, but I'm here representing the hockey community right now as the president of the English Hockey Association. And um, I, I don't want us to all be gladiators <laughs> fighting in a ring and tearing our community apart. So I I implore that the people I listen to a lot of different perspectives and realize that whatever plan we choose is going to hurt everyone. This is a hard problem to solve, and nothing's going to feel good. And so um, I've asked members of my association to come and speak so that the community can understand the really important role that. Um, hockey plays in making this a wonderful place to be, a place where a lot of different types of people are are together and they're exercising and they're being healthy and they're, and so I, I've asked them to speak and um, I guess that's my talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Um. Hi, I'm Annalie. I am a player of HA, um, um, English Hockey Association. I play for the Anosa Girls on top of you. I am here to represent all the boys and girls, the children that love hockey with the soul, with the body, with the, every part of the, um, with the, like, Everything. Um, my my purpose here is to let everybody know how much I love hockey, how much my family in this community, how much the world loves it, and I just um, I am here to just help all the kids um, in the world to make them know how I love. How um, thank you for hockey and just hockey thing. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Welcome. And then uh, so the next three individuals are gonna be Cassie Campbell, Rob Marks, and Rob Forbes. Hi, my name is Brian Gross. I run the recreational hockey program for the Acres Hockey Association. I also run the girls' high school program, and I run the St. Kirk's Women's Adult Hockey League. Um, I've been coaching in Anchorage for 25 years, and um, seen lots of kids go up through our program. When hockey was um, forced to play outside during COVID and the homeless shelter was at Sullivan, um, we witnessed a whole lot of unusual things that we weren't used to. Um, I usually try to arrive at the outdoor rinks a half an hour before all the kids arrived and the coaches. And I would go around and collect up all the liquor bottles, clean up the needles, sometimes feces, and try to make it um, a place where kids were as little exposed to that stuff as possible. Having a home shelter right next door, that was a challenge, and we often see some homeless staying through, um, sometimes passing out right next to the rink. Sometimes passed out in the port potty. Um, and we tried to minimize this impact on the hockey community as best we could, but it was a challenge. Um, I recognize that Dempsey and Boki are currently off the plan, but until the vote happens Monday, we're all nervous. Um, 
And we have a concern that this were to go back to you know, Dennis or Logan, put this right next to a school, would be of extreme concern um, having so many children right next door. Um, we saw some homeless you know, shooting up right in front of the kids, saw some homeless exposing themselves, stripping completely naked in the parking lot there, saw them defecating next to the buildings, um, all in sight of the children. Um, and sometimes even inside of security, and there was rarely something done. So, um, very concerned about losing these rights. The other thing I want to say is, studies show that kids that are involved in youth sports get better grades, they have less depression, higher self-esteem, less likely to get involved in illicit drugs. And studies also show that a high percentage of homeless have substance abuse problems. So hockey and other youth sports are very good at preventing homelessness. And I would hate to see us take some facilities that are preventing future homelessness away from the children and used for other purposes and putting them right next to a school. So I'm here just to reiterate our support of, of, of not using Dempsey Anderson for the homeless shelter or Ben Mokirina. These facilities are very important to our community um, to prevent homelessness for future generations. So I think those are the worst solutions for solving this complex problem. We can come together and get a permanent solution that solves this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Cassie Campbell, and I'm a resident of Assembly District 1. I'm here to testify in support of removing Dempsey and Novoki Icerinas from the suggested Tier 1 list of potential emergency shelters beginning October 1st. These incredibly fragile facilities house thousands of youth and adult athletes in the ice skating community, and today I'm here representing one small piece of that as the Girls Development Director of the Anchorage Hockey Association. In this role, I oversee the development of over 125 female athletes, ages 5 and 19, that play hockey for our association of over 600 athletes. As of right now, my girls program is scheduled to utilize one of these two buildings over 185 times from October through March outside of tournaments. In the past three years, our city's youth have continuously been used as pawns in a fractured political system, and it needs to stop. Sure, we've had our wings up to this point and we've been able to continue as normal, whatever that means, this whole time. Not so fast. In the plan that was implemented, we placed children next to a mass shelter on outdoor ice that needed to be swept for needles prior to starting, asked them to turn away as they were being flashed by individuals loitering around the area, to ignore requests to buy drugs off of people sitting outside the doors of these facilities. We asked them to walk into facilities with security guards at the door, to use a buddy system when entering or exiting these facilities, and to get undressed in the rink lobbies because better space is not available. Their other option? Not to show up to the rink, because these rinks are the only ones we have. Today, we're at risk of asking them to completely give up a sport that they've worked hard at. You might tell yourself that's not what's happening here, but it's simply not. With the removal of Sullivan Arena as a home of our anchor full rings, one of the rings in Bimboki becomes completely unavailable to you Friday and Saturday home games, evenings, beginning at 4 p.m. The other side of the rink remains open and forces families to struggle to find parking and children to have to dress and undress in the lobby in order to accommodate the junior teams. This is a sacrifice our community made in order to make hockey at this level available in our city, and we made it work. But removing Dempsey Anderson means one of these weekends, or on these weekends, we go from four ice services to one. Thousands of individuals simply can't operate on 75% of space, less space. Why are we putting our children in a position to make sacrifices for a problem that's ours as an adult to find solutions for? There's no perfect solution to this need in our city, but we've officially gone too far. I'm urging the assembly to seek other options that don't include asking children to sacrifice but rather empower ourselves as adults to act like adults, to put our differences aside, and find a solution that leaves our children safe and leaves them alone. Thank you. Welcome. I was a member of the Cold Weather Shelter Task Force. We were tasked with recommending 
a creative, humane, cost-effective emergency shelter solution. We were tasked to do this in absence of any real detailed information provided by this city's administration. For 15 months, I've attended the assembly meetings and forums. For 15 months, I've not heard detailed information regarding what this mayor's vision for helping solve homelessness actually consists of. Even while bringing out-of-state consultants, the administration is limited how much they will collaborate with people and agencies in this town. There was scant notice or information when the city elected to shut down the Sullivan Arena and relocate unsheltered to Centennial Park. So the task force had a very short month to offer suggestions. The only immediately available options were large municipal owned properties. So in a frustrating political theater, the task force was pitted against the Anchorage hockey community, us and them. If you ask any task force member, I'm certain no one wanted to recommend an ice cream. Lost in all this is any emergency solution is not a solution at all. Neither was closing the Sullivan, nor opening Centennial Park, nor now closing Centennial Park, nor now considering reopening Sullivan Arena. Until we as a city realize that homelessness is a complex societal issue and not some chosen lifestyle for which people should be criminalized or shunned or shamed or even shipped out of town as was suggested on Wednesday, Solving homelessness requires, in Anchorage, more affordable housing, more housing vouchers, more mental health treatment, more substance abuse treatment, more job training programs, more access to affordable medication, more independent living skill classes. None of these have been discussed. Solving homelessness is not done by shelter alone, and it's not done by disenfranchising unsheltered people and making them voiceless pawns in this political game. There is no solution when you needlessly shut down an emergency shelter, when you needlessly relocate people to camp in a park or on the outskirts of town to disrupt their access to what agencies and resources can help them. Regardless of the new trauma heaped on top of the old trauma, there was a question Wednesday, what do we do if we do nothing? What happens? The answer is people will die and they have died. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sir, sorry, I don't think we got your name on the record. Robert Marks. Thank you. Um, welcome. The next three individuals uh, on the list are Olga Hayes, Liam Hayes, and Kate McClellan. I can wait until either the end or tomorrow night. Kate. Kate, thanks. Um, so then uh, we have Julie Blair. Welcome. Okay. Hi, I'm Ron Forbes. I'm the resident of North Anchorage, and I actually just came from Dempsey, where one of my daughters was playing a game. So it's uh, it's really fitting that we're here today talking about this and. One of the things that I think is really important is defining what an emergency is. And the definition of an emergency is a serious situation or occurrence that happens unexpectedly and demands immediate action. And definition two would be a condition of urgent need for action or assistance. And I certainly appreciate the unique situation we're in. What I can't understand is how so many well-educated and very engaged people such as yourselves and including the mayor's office uh, have not been able to understand that october comes every year it's a 12-month calendar and typically the temperatures start to go down around this time of the year and we're sitting here as i drive in today and i see encampments on the land over here by cutting park with stone throw from the child's park 
Uh, I was at uh, Serrano's the other night. I see homeless camps all the way down the sidewalk. And I fully understand and am empathetic to the, to the situation that they're in. And I wrote extensively about substance abuse, drug abuse, and some of my struggles personally with that. And I am, am, am very uh, empathetic to the fact this is a complicated problem. But what we didn't need to do was not do our jobs throughout the spring in getting this problem solved ahead of time. And then at the last minute, we come together in, in not perfect circumstances. And you guys do end up naming Dixie Anderson as a homeless shelter. And I heard the other day uh, somebody commenting about the trauma of putting the homeless back in Solar Marina. And while I understand that, if you are coming from our side as a hockey community, the trauma of, again, ripping away the rings from our children and our families in a way that was so abrupt and so unforeseen in COVID, we've shouldered a massive burden as a hockey community that we ultimately didn't deserve. We wrote it out as an organization and as members of the community, and we somehow made it through it. But to have this come out of the blue two years later harkens to a PTSD feeling, something where we can't really trust what exactly is going on in our government, and our kids don't need to be pawns in a political game of putting out a hockey rink that we knew was going to get a ton of community pushback so that ultimately we could get our hands on other facilities that ultimately would have been not as popular had we not done that instead. So I'm happy that you removed those rinks from the list. My suggestion would be Dempsey Anderson, Ben Boki, or other youth forward facility should never be considered as a part of a homeless solution due to the lack of this assembly's planning and the fact that we have done our job. Thank you. Welcome. Um, good afternoon. My name is Olga Keys, and um, I, as well, volunteer with um, Anchorage Hockey Association. I, my name is Olga Keys, and I volunteer with Anchorage Hockey Association as a board member and as a U and under hockey coach. Both of my children are in the program, and my son is going through a few rest program, and my daughter just started learning to skate, learning to play this year. And um, while it's clear that there are no easy options on the table that would allow municipality to meet the October 1st deadline, I implore you not to utilize Dempsey Anderson and Ben Boki ice rings as homeless shelters for this winter. It would take them out for the entire 2022-2023 hockey season because it's gonna, it, even after they're utilized, it's going to take time, effort, and money to bring them back online. And that is, as we can see with Sullivan Arena, is not an easy process. And this is also time our children are not going to get back. And um, at the risk of sounding cheesy and overdramatic, I do ask you to please do not solve this very important problem at the expense of our children. And I also ask you to please work together to get this resolved, because as our president, Jeannie Carey, pointed out, pointing finger at each other and fighting just wastes our time, and we need a solution that is not gonna require sacrifices from our children. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Liam, and I love hockey, and so do a lot of other children and people. And if you're making a homeless shelter, we can't play hockey, and it's going to take a while to find another one. It's our home ring, but we love hockey, we want to play it, and we all love it, and we don't want to take it, we don't want to not play hockey, and we really love hockey. So. If you, if you would, please not take away Dempsey or Bogey because it's our best uh, hockey places and we love it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, the next three individuals I have on the list are Dr. Kelly Lewis, Irene Wortnick, and uh, Tam Agostini Giesler. Hi, my name is Julie Dwyer. Rehabilitation is a key component to transitioning the homeless. 
This is Emily, who's been taking, who's been talking about this housing for homeless for the past five to six years that I've been active in these meetings. Chris, I'd appreciate it if you pay attention. You have done nothing but enable these that don't want help. You have increased the size of the homelessness in the last five to six years. You have continued to allow illegal use of our parks, continued to use illegal, these people to use illegal drugs, even to provide a safe place for them to do their drug of choice, including exchanging, exchanging the needles. In all the communities, and in all of this is in the community's expense. When the assembly places people in hotels, churches, and community event facilities, they have all been destroyed at the taxpayer's expense. We are now paying for the laundry service. Now, at one time that I heard you talk about rehabilitating services. Again, I say there are 30 to 40 programs in Anchorage that do provide all services to transition people into the community. Catholic Social Services, for example, seems to do a great job transitioning refugees into this community. I see them. I see a number of the refugees that have succeeded in transitioning nicely without further assistance. The people of Anchorage have been more than gracious, patient, and willing to help with homeless crisis for many years. But you have created a revolving door for those who don't want help, not until they want it, when they need shelter at this time, food, clothing, each winter, again, at the taxpayer's expense. This is not a transition, this is not transitioning people into the community, it's called enabling. Opening shelters every winter is not working anymore. I want to thank Mayor Brian Bronson for breaking ground to the new navigation center to start turning this crisis around. Staffing this facility can come from the number of nonprofit units in this in an Anchorage and put them in under one roof. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Kelly Lewis. I'm a lifelong Alaskan and I'm a property owner. I also was the former director of organizational development and the deputy director of property appraisal for 14 and a half years. I know several of you and have worked with you in the community. I'm committed to our community. I'm here today not to debate the pros and cons of using the Golden Lion as a shelter for unhoused individuals, as I believe it's inevitable. Rather, I am here as a concerned daughter for my mother who lives in Geneva Woods. As you may not be aware, my mother owns the only vacant lot that is located in Geneva Woods. It is located directly on Rome Circle. This vacant lot directly abuts my mother's home. I have the personal identify, um, identification numbers if you would like for her home and the lot. I will provide that. This vacant lot is less than 100 yards away from the Golden Lion. Over the 24 years that my mother has lived in her home, Despite no trespassing signs, there's been several instances when individuals have pitched tents. Through the graciousness and kindness of her neighbors, those neighbors have assisted in the removal of those individuals. In an effort to again reinforce the no trespassing status of the property, on Friday, I posted 28 no trespassing signs on the property. But I know it's not enough. I want to keep my mother safe. And when you move 120 people into the Golden Lion, history will repeat itself. As noted by the hockey community, which I respect and support, the experience of homeless individuals has had a profound effect on the youth. Let's also consider the community of the Geneva Woods community. Predominantly, these are senior citizens. I'm hearing, what I'm here today to do is to ask, what is your plan to keep my mother safe as well as her neighbors? History is bound to repeat itself, and I'm very concerned about the safety of my mother. Please know that if anything happens
comes to my mother or her neighbors, I will hold all members of the assembly and the administration responsible for her safety. Personally responsible. So I'm asking you, what are you going to do to keep my mom safe? Thank you. Thank you. If you want to give that to uh, Mr. Turner, that'd be great. Thanks. And um, I would ask just a reminder to what I stated earlier. If you could please avoid clapping in between. That will help uh, move this quicker. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, my name is Irene Wolchek, and I live in College Village. Thank you for all the work you are doing, and also for holding this extra meeting today, so that those of us that cannot come tomorrow night can still have our voices heard. That said, in the spirit of Rosh Hashanah, a time for reflecting on the past year and hoping for good things for the year ahead, I am here to show support for the Emergency Shelter Task Force Plan that has been proposed. Mistakes have been made, and now it is time to take action to ensure that our vulnerable, houseless neighbors have adequate shelter and services as winter approaches. I am pleased that a number of places will be utilized, and especially the Golden Lion Hotel. My husband and I have lived less than a mile away for over 33 years. We walk or drive by frequently, and it has been very, very disconcerting to see it sitting empty over the summer while knowing that people are freezing in tents with inadequate amenities, a situation that could and should have been avoided. One of the tenets of Judaism is to come along or carry the world. It is time for us to do our part and to help our neighbors in need. Passing this proposal will be a great start. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. The next three speakers will be Elaine Flu, Carl Madsen, and Ron Oliva. Hi, my name is Tam Agosti Beesler. I'm a resident of the College of the Georgia Park neighborhood that is uh, close to the Golden Lion. I'm here to uh, express my dismay that that facility, which is owned by the municipality, and is 100% ready for people to move in and stay there, has not been utilized this summer. I strongly support the use of the Golden Lion facility. I can tell you, as someone who walks in the woods in that area and over in the Geneva Woods area with my dog, I would much rather have homeless people in the Golden Lion than in the woods where I surprise them and they for, therefore they may feel threatened and therefore I feel threatened or come across um, frozen bodies in the winter. I think that's a facility that definitely needs to be on the line in your emergency uh, uh, task force now. The use of the Dempsey and Ben Bokey and Sullivan, I think are inappropriate. I think mean, going back, to, uh, going to the Sullivan again is a step backwards in the plan. And I'm hoping many of the other facilities we have vacant in the uh, Anchorage Bowl area could be utilized instead even if it's a temporary piece until the navigation center is ready. You know, as a community, I've, we've lived here since 1959, and I remember telling my mother telling me as a young person that the reason she loved and stayed in this community for her entire life was because as Anchorageites, we set aside our political differences, um, regardless of our religions, our socioeconomic conditions, we all work together to find solutions. We are smarter than this, folks. We need to find solutions and we need to find them now. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. I think that next I have Elaine. Um, my name is Elaine Flu, and um, first, um, I have a brother that was homeless for many, many years, and I also have a son who plays hockey. And my big concerns are that um, there should be no services provided to homeless people that adversely affect our youth or our sports. And so I'm not in favor of using Boki or Dempsey or the Sullivan Arena. The Sullivan Arena needs to be used for the Wolverines. And the Wolverines are taking on a huge number of huge costs by having 
having to pay for out-of-state travel and out-of-state places for them to play in so that they can, because they don't have a soul and it's part of their contract to be able to play in that league that they need a facility that's the size of the soul of the arena. And so they are losing money every year. And that money goes to pay for city taxes and goes to pay for other things, and so it should not be considered. I am in favor of doing everything you can for the homeless, but not at the expense of sports or children. So I'm not in favor of taking away the rec center or any of the other places where there is facilities for children. I do think that there may be a solution if you don't have enough space. I don't see why the, the camper has to close. You know, by the way, I have all kinds of homes, guys, that sleep in the woods near my house that stay there all winter. And I don't really want them moved out of this centennial park now and coming closer to where I walk my dog and living in the woods, at least if they are going outside a campground. I went over to the campground today to check it out, and there's plenty of room for over 150 people in that camp. And many of those people would rather camp outside than be in some congregate type of facility. And so I would suggest that maybe we keep the campground open a little bit longer until you can find some better places to put them about that don't affect our view. Thank you. Welcome. <coughs> Hello, my name is Carl Madsen. Uh, I moved into the city of Anchorage uh, early in 2019 off of 400 East 204th. Didn't have any crime problems for the first year, and then the shelter opened up to solve and I had my vehicle broken into three or four times, my garage broken into a half dozen times. The police just stopped responding, uh, basically just said it was just not missing too bad. Uh, the security from the Sullivan Arena said that I lived one block outside of their security area so they would not patrol. Uh, I ended up purchasing a house in Geneva Woods just to get away from the crime. <laughs> kind of ironic. Uh, I'm an engineer, I looked at the zoning rules and I was like, sweet, this is a good neighborhood, don't have to worry about it. And then a couple months after I'm in contract, you guys changed the zoning for homeless. So anyway, after listening to the hockey crowd, I sympathize with them immensely. Um, I also found needles in my truck because somebody broke in to it to shoot up. Um, had to go in and get an emergency test for lots of nasty things due to that incident. Uh, I realize there's no easy solution to this, but I just beg you guys to realize that every time you move this around, you're creating additional stress on residents that pay a fair bit of taxes. It's not cheap living in Anchorage. So. Please consider carefully what you do and where you put people. I am obviously not in support of the gold mine, but it would be nice to have a permanent solution instead of a bunch of temporary solutions. Thank you for your time, and thank you for holding this special meeting so I could attend today. Thank you. Welcome. The next three individuals on the list are Billy Hankborn, Linda Mankoff, I believe, and Judy Drave. Welcome. I'd like to point of personal privilege in honor of Mr. Haberman on due process. The chairman should not be allowed to take a vote on any sense of this body without first publicizing that. And the reason for that is bodies can be stacked, and that taints this whole public process. So give me back my time. It's in Robert's rules. My name is Juan Leva. I have been a victim of the overflow being adjacent to the shelter. And I sympathize with everyone, but multiply that by 15,000. I'm leaving because you won. The homeless have won. They have more rights than anyone else. I object and oppose any homeless shelter expansion, especially the Brother Francis shelter, who has been a terrible adjacent owner, occupant, leaseholder, but never worked. 
And so they ruined not only my business, my family, my spirit, and my belief in the political system. I can look at the history, but I've been there 42 years, and I want to commend this administration out of all the past administrations have done the most in solving the homeless problem. Uh, their efforts are exemplary and their results have hit some real walls unnecessarily. But from the time Brother Dave and Brother Bob and I helped start the shelter and the mission, they've lost their way. Anyone adjacent to a shelter Move, move as quickly as you can and cut your losses. I'm moving, I'm done, it's unsafe. I've been broke into eight times in 20 days. And everything you say, if your lips move, I won't call you a liar, but it's not the truth. Because if it's the golden lion, never be a shelter. It'll be a shelter. If it's Brother Francis, you're never going to build in a heavy industrial area, you rebuild. It's sad, but uh, they're coming back, and there's only one result for myself, my family, and my business is get out. And so I'm meeting with Nancy Burke. I asked her to call me. Uh, my land has been vetted for a place. And what I realized the biggest mistake is you spread this across the city. You should have centralized the services because you've done more harm by spreading this problem throughout the city. Thank you. Um, so I, I read the last name, uh, the third name on, so it's Terry Drake is the third individual. Thank you, Ron. And I didn't get my check, Felix. Thank you, I'm Ron. still waiting you short of a quarter of a million. Thank you, Ron. Thanks. I'll be waiting. I'll see you tomorrow. And I'm just saying my time to my day. Okay, sure. So then the uh, next individual, since uh, Mr. Drake is not taking the opportunity to today, will be Mr. Danny Parrish. Welcome. No, he's third. Excuse me. My apologies for that confusion. Go ahead. Next uh, so I have Billy Hemthorne, then Ms. Mankoff, then Mr. Parrish. Hello, I'm uh, Billy Hemthorne. I want to say my support for this bill and uh, plan for it, as well as my sympathy for the homeless, as well as the people uh, you know playing hockey and whatnot. I totally get that. It's just that in Anchorage we have a responsibility to take care, take care of our state, the people that live in it, and. With winter coming up, it's simply too cold to be letting people just die on the streets in the woods. I don't think uh, to do that would be a failure to like to, to the city, especially as councilmen, councilwomen. Um, we need to do better, and I think moving people around as a temporary alternative is only making things worse as well. Like more, more steps being taken to ensure that these people are not being like kicked out of the places they call home because they don't have houses. These camps are their home, and that's how they feel. They like having their stuff treated as trash. It, it, it's just like I don't. I completely disagree that they have the same rights as everyone else. These are these are people that have been failed by society, failed by like every every system of government we have. It, something needs to be done about it. That's all I have. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Linda Mankoff, and I am a longtime resident of Goodwood, Goodwood, Alaska, and I'm also a community health worker at the local clinic. I know that the purpose of today's meeting is to address and to develop solutions for homelessness in Anchorage. And of course, these needs are urgent. I am here asking the assembly and the mayor to please do not forget about Goodwood when discussing homelessness. As a community health worker, I see people on a daily basis with their, for basic needs, health care, food, and housing. And housing is increasing, um, the need is increasing. Local grants have gone up 30 to 40%. So of course, more people are reaching out, please help. 
We don't have the resources in Riverwood, so we have to come down here. We do the best we can, giving them a night to stay, and that's because local churches step up. Our numbers don't compare to Anchorage, but I fear as the need grows in Riverwood, we will also find our situation to be urgent. Although, to those who are currently homeless in Riverwood, the need is urgent. Gurdwood is a beautiful place, and so it's not easy to see that need. That's for those of you who come to visit. You don't see the people living in their trucks, greenhouses, or the tents in the baths for us. So I just ask, as a community member, to please do not forget about Gurdwood. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we go to you, Mr. Parrish, I do need to uh, extend the meeting. Um, let's go ahead and just do a uh, half hour for now, because I'm not sure how many other individuals would like to speak. So, is there a second? Okay. okay. Is there any objection? Okay, so we are extended until 3.30. Um, welcome. The next three individuals will be Irene Quignell, Virginia Lancer, and Marianne Burke. Good afternoon. I am Danny Parrish. It's a pleasure to see all you guys again. Uh, I know that everybody's heard from me at least once or twice or maybe 45 times. Um, but I don't live 100 yards away. I live less than 20 feet away. And that's because my driveway is directly in front of the Sullivan Arena. I support the fact that people need housing, they need food, they need health care, 100%. I've been a social worker for 45 years. I've shared many times my resources with people. However, I'm 64 years old. I am not safe living in my home because my home is right in front of the arena. I also support the hockey kids. I see all these kids all over the parking lot and all of the people that are care less about kids all over the parking lot with their vodka and their drugs and naked and eating and pooping and actually having sex on the sidewalk in front of my house. So for the kids, the arenas are off the limits. I mean, just take it off and find something, you know, that doesn't have children right there. Northway Mall, I hate to say that word again, but I said it 20 times. Or do what the organization I work for, 35 years ago, 40 years ago, we started buying houses, putting people in the houses, giving them a staff. They had a bedroom, there was a kitchen, and a living room, and a bathroom, and it's been really successful. Um, you know, we took all the people out of the institutions, API, um, we went down and got these clothes and brought people home from the lower 48, put them in real homes. That's what will solve this problem. And I already know we've dumped $10 billion or $1 million into this problem, but if we've taken that money and started buying little three bedroom houses for $250,000, $350,000 a pop, I think we would have enough bedrooms for everybody that's homeless. Um, I really support the hockey kids. Y'all put up a big old fence through the Celebrina parking lot last year. All that I did was just have them go around the building and still get over there and do stupid things, throw their liquor bottles in my yard, throw their needles in my yard. I've had to go out to my front door multiple times with a handgun and a baseball bat, saying, get out of my driveway or I'll either shoot you or hit you. I've told you guys multiple times from there. I spoke to the organization I work for, and I said, you know, keep as many people in as we can, but just putting them in a matchup is not a solution. Give them a place to sleep. Any questions? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Irene Queen House, and I, you know I like to remind you and the people of things. The timeline you had in your presentation is not going far enough back. 
If the assembly would not have put a monkey wrench into the process every step of the way, way the navigation center would have been in operation last fall. And we would not be where we are now. You approve the navigation center early this year, but then just two weeks ago, you killed the continued funding, again making sure it would not be able to meet the deadline so you can blame the mayor and push through your plan. In August, uh, on August 11th, 2020, AO 2020-66S was approved. It was brought forward by then Mayor Austin Quinn Davidson, Felix Rivera, Meg Zalatel, and Chris Constant, and it talked about approving the purchase of several buildings. The original ordinance did not include what I'm going to read. Um, Ms. Zalatel is the one who brought that amendment forward. This is in section one, uh, point C, the Golden Lion Hotel. Authorization to acquire this property is under the condition that one, under no circumstances, shall the property be used as a homeless and transient shelter, and that use is controlled and uh, the, as the, that use is defined in Title 21, while under municipalities ownership or control. So this is an AO, it was voted on, which means it is now law. So your suggestion to use the Golden Lion as a shelter is against the law that you yourself made. And lastly, my question is, before COVID hit, there were several churches here in town that would pick up people, shelter them for the night, and drive people to work and the kids to school, people that were homeless. That program was very successful and churches are still willing to do that. So is this still being used? I wasn't able to do the research on it, but like I said, it was very successful and I don't understand if we're not using it anymore, why we're not using it. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Virginia Monser. I live in Geneva Woods, only a couple of walks from the Golden Lion. And it sounds like the only option left for me is to pray that the state runs a highway through that property. Mm. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, the next three individuals on the list are LaVon Rainier, Janelle Walton, and Colleen Bauman. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Ann Burke, and I've lived in Alaska, specifically Anchorage, for many, many years. During that time, I owned four different prop residential properties that I've lived in. I've always felt comfortable and safe where I live. One of the things I always looked for was the neighborhood. What was it like? Did I feel that it would be a welcoming, safe place to live? I have been satisfied. Unfortunately, one young man, 14 years old, who was out from one of our local, um, actually, I don't really know what they're called, but when they keep children locked up for juvenile crimes, he decided that my house was a uh, very interesting one and shimmied up the side of the deck, went through my house, every single room. And fortunately, our neighbors saw what was going on and we had the most wonderful response from the Anchorage Police Department. I am concerned about safety. I am deeply concerned. I have lived in office. I said I've lived here for many years. I have heard this discussion about the homeless since the day I got here, which was over 15 years ago. You think we had time to get solved? I am not blaming anyone. I know I can't change history. But why do we make decisions like purchasing the Golden Lion and having it set empty? 
the tax rolls so you and I pay their share of the taxes. And yet, we now have a critical situation, and I am fully in support of helping the homeless. I am not, however, in favor of rush to get some sort of band-aid on this bottom and we'll come and we'll deal with it again, as we have for 50 years. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, LeVon right here. I, we have you on the list. If you don't want to speak, that's fine, man, but I do have you on the list. I don't want to sign kind of major reaction. You don't have to speak. It's up to you. There he is, actually my neighbor. I live next Can you speak into the mic, please, ma'am? Not too sharp to anyone. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very honest neighbor. I live next to her name. Lake Lodge. I lived there since 1981. I own a duplex there. I guess the most impactful thing I could say is that last Saturday, I had a man enter my house. I had opened the door because my house was hot and was leaking. I had a small uh, video of him leaping up onto my front step, walking into the doorway, and standing there. And I was in the living room at the time. And so I looked up, it, it sounded like one of my boys. And there he was, standing there, a fairly sharp person. He was salivating. I didn't know what he wanted. I wanted him out. So I went over to him and I said, get out. You don't live here. This is my house. You have to leave. And I shut the door. And that was kind of a wake up call for me that this is probably going to happen more. It hasn't happened so far. I've had to get those things stolen. I've had people come to me their hands they brought. You're looking at the only person who picks a grown circle. 21 pails, uh, ice melt sized. 21 ice melt sized pails, um, debris, leaves, gravel, trash, excrement, <coughs> everything that's in the street every spring. This spring, I hauled it up and I dumped it on the wireways of the people that don't have houses there, which includes a federal building and a private person. I don't need any help with this. I've done this since 1981. Usually, people will give me their cars there. I have a big investment in the neighborhood because I've done this for so long. And um, I have no support for this. I just do it. I've been a good neighbor. And, you know, I have very mixed feelings about your own line because <coughs> there's not going to be any cleanup detail for that or anything else. It's just going to be put there. That's my feeling. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. I'm Michelle Walton. I'm in District. Um, I'm here because um, the moment that I saw that the recreational center go off the board, I knew what was going to naturally happen next was that Solon Marina was going to go back on the table. And with a week and a massive screw up with the homelessness situation in the Centennial Park and being a week away from needing to come up with a solution, it didn't surprise me at all that they ended up on there. Um, and I, obviously, I don't want it to be there. Uh, I went two blocks. We suffered a lot as a result of that. Um, we were about halfway between the Solomon Marina and the Cars on Gamble. So we've, everything that the Kaki community is saying is absolutely true. I'm putting up the fencing, did absolutely nothing. Um, and then, so I would say the biggest thing, and I think you're hearing from the room in general, there's a huge level of fear of a lot of crime and um, kids and you know people seeing things that they shouldn't be seeing. So I guess the biggest request that I have is come up with a mitigation plan. Um, we've got to we've got to do something more. Um, having security out there, um, protecting kids, protecting the community. Um, I know I personally have over and over and over again um, had to repaint graffiti on the yak, and the city's never come in and painted that. The solar memory is still to this day destroyed, and the number of graffiti that's on there anymore that just keeps happening. And so we'll put some money into that. We have an alcohol tax for a reason. Um, so this is something that can be mitigated. And the second thing I would say is that I'm, there's a real big difference between the Silver Arena and the Golden Lion. The type of housing is radically different. Um, you know, when I tell people about what we used to horrifically call the Red Nose Inn, run by rural cap, but that is still operating. 
And it's operating successfully, and people don't know that it's operating because they did something, right? What was it that they did right? And we've been talking to Roland Cap to find out why they have managed to make it so that we never see people out on the street selling drugs. We don't see garbage out there ever. And you would not know that that was a hotel or not a hotel unless you actually knew. So they're doing, it's possible to make that happen in an appropriate way. But I think the way that it's been going about for the last two years has not been going well. We've been doing a huge amount of damage. And that's leading to a lot of what you're hearing in the voice from the community is that fear of, you know, um, drugs and alcohol and, you know, I mean, I need to say my daughter was driving around here, we were talking about homelessness on the backside of Blue Sack, and we were driving after getting books and around and there was a bunch of homeless, and there was a man walking down the street with his pants completely down. And, you know, she's a teenager and she said, Mom, I, did I just see my first penis ever? This is not how I want this to happen. And I said, I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. This is, you shouldn't see this. We need the housing so we get these books off the street. If we don't have that housing, we can't mitigate what's going on. We all see what's going on. So I want to urge you, please, try to mitigate as much as possible what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Um, we have two more individuals on the list, and then I'll explain afterward what we're going to do. So we have Liliana Walton and Jim Short. Hi, um, my name is Keelan Bachman. I am a resident of the 30 neighborhood. Um, over the last few years, you know, Sullivan Maria continues as a homeless shelter, and as many people have testified before you, the increase in graffiti, drug paraphernalia, alcohol, you know, just left everywhere has been a major issue, and I just really want to urge you guys to, to um, uh, put a little more budget into security in the area. Um, just, you know, a month ago, my apartment has covered working for us. I showed up home from work one day, and there had been a mini homeless camp set up, and when I tried to pull into my spot, a woman threatened to kill me and destroy my car. Um, and I ended up having to call my parents and, you know, I'm 28 years old, I had to call and I was like, Mom, I'm actually genuinely really scared right now. And I spent the night with her. Um, so please, I, I just think it would be really important for you guys to increase the budget on specifically security um, and mitigation measures. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, hi, my name is Lily and I was the daughter who saw me. Um, uh, well, um, a year ago, there has been a lot of stuff, well, more than a year ago, there's a lot of other stuff, there's been vandalism, there's been, I've seen drugs happen, like trade drugs and stuff, and I've also seen my yard catch on fire. Um, a homeless guy, he was from. He had whiskey or some alcohol. And, you know, he was coming around and he kind of poured it on the grass. And he also had a cigarette. And he he accidentally dropped it. And I was in my room at the time. And all I could hear is my mom let me say Lily. And I came out and I just see her sobbing and crying because she's so frightened and scared of the, um, the fire. I mean, I've seen more stuff happen. And I'm also on the side with the hockey players as well. They shouldn't have to see all of that. <laughs> um, I'm telling this story because I want you to understand what happens when you have so many homeless people in just one location without security or monitoring the neighborhood where the shelter is located. The city should spread shelters in other areas around the city so one neighborhood doesn't have to have so many homeless people in just one neighborhood. It's, I've been scared my, well, for the past double and a half actually. And I'm just scared to even just walk around or just go outside my neighborhood or my backyard. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Jim Short. Uh, first off, I was here Wednesday with a lot of the other members here for the 
guests here, I guess, I'd like to thank the assembly and the mayor's office for uh, taking this extra duty that basically we were all heard. I know there was a frustration on Wednesday that not everybody got to speak. Um, I feel the need to start with the fact that I have great compassion for the homeless community here in Anchorage. Having said that, I'm strongly opposed to the co-opting of any facility used for sports, of the use of the city, physical activity, uh, especially during our long park winters, uh, helps lead to lower rates of sadness, depression, suicide, drug and alcohol abuse. Um, ironically, these are all risk factors for homelessness. While I'm now a pilot for an airline here in town, one of the reasons that I was on a call in a high school dropout, frankly, was my participation in youth hockey. Uh, youth sports really are more uh, about so much more than just sport. Um, all three of my kids, Hunter, Garrett, and Tanner, belong to AHA and play regularly at both MC and Hokey. I know that uh, we've stepped back, hopefully, from the use of those facilities, but obviously uh, the loss of those facilities would be a huge detriment to their sport. These are specialized facilities. The last uh, rink, I believe, was built decades ago here in Anchorage. We haven't had a facility in some time. Um, the loss of Dempsey, Bokey, and Sullivan would actually result in the loss of more than half the rates here in town. During the last two years when Sullivan was used as a homeless shelter, our kids played outside of Mulcahy. During that time, they were exposed to drug and alcohol abuse, dirty needles, fighting between homeless uh, uh, clients of the shelter, verbal abuse, public intoxication, urination, and defecation. One of the coaches was hurt when he attempted to remove a combative drunk from the ice during practice. Anchor GMS and police responded multiple times, including a call for a gun. During at least one of those years, we weren't even supposed to be there. We were supposed to drop our kids and leave. Obviously, we didn't do that. We are now discussing doing the same thing in proximity to schools. Again, I hope that's not going to happen. It sounds like we moved away from that. Um, while acknowledging that homelessness here in Anchorage is a real and present problem, I submit that the co-opting of any of these brain streets is a shelter is a horrible idea. I urge all parties involved to find an answer that does not include any facility uh, municipal sports facility, I respect to the members of the task force. Taking these facilities is not an option. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next we are going to go to any individuals who haven't already spoken and can't attend Monday. Can I get a sense of hands of those individuals? Okay, so if those individuals can line up, please, we'll go ahead and start with that. <coughs> Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Anderson. In 2020, we have purchased several buildings. Um, we used to live at the Golden Mine and we used to promise uh, for our own shelter. You promise lots of things, you don't necessarily follow through on those promises. Sometimes you can write them to one and then to the So, here we are. My family lived in Heather Meadows, directly behind the former Alaska Club, which was identified as a site that you decided that you would purchase in 2020. We moved. We moved because of Ron Lee's passionate testimony. We moved because we saw what's happening in the neighborhoods around the receptors. We deliberately chose a neighborhood that was nowhere near B3 zoning because we could see that this assembly would break another promise and change B3 zoning for homelessness. Thank God we did that because we did. We changed B3 zoning. So we we're very fortunate that we had the resources to move. We we're very fortunate that we had the foresight to stay away from B3 zoning. Nobody should have to think like that. We complain a lot that there's not enough affordable housing. That is true. Buying houses for the sake of putting homes in them will not help anybody. It will drive the cost of housing up. We've seen that in California. We like to mow down our mobile home parks and plant great big, huge tall buildings. There's some kind of stigma over living in a mobile home. There shouldn't be. I lived in a mobile home for many years in the 90s, and it was a godsend. We, you could take action to make mobile home parks easier. You could update them. You could change code 
to make that a more attractive option for businesses to go into hosting mobile home parks. We could change that. You could also get off your pride. You could put down hubris. You could get over yourselves. And you could follow our mayor's plan. You could have done that when he was elected. He had a good solution. But you're too proud, proudful. You are too full of pride to do that. Stop it. Stop worrying about your own egos. Follow the mayor's plan. We would have had plenty of housing if you had done that. I'm so disappointed in each one of you. I want to believe good in you. I pray for you. I want you to do well. I want you to help solve the problems in the city. We will always have people who are in trouble. Alcoholism is a disease. Drug use is a disease. You're doing nothing to solve that. Both of my parents died of alcoholism, and today my sister is in an ICU in a hospital in Southern California dying of her alcoholism. I'm not ignorant of how difficult it is to change that behavior because it is a disease, it is an addiction. It's it. Thank you. Welcome. And I just want to first thank the assembly, uh, and the coalition of task force, and uh, thank the administration. I think that there has been good agreement of taking the price awareness and the community centers off the table and recognizing the needs of the community and balancing that with all of the people who live here in Anchorage and in the greater, honestly, state of Alaska. Everything does come down to Anchorage to receive services. This is the one stop last time for a lot of people. And the fact that we are a large city with 300,000, I believe in support at this moment in time for me to celebrate. I was a nurse that was involved in getting immunizations and COVID, and I saw the success in that it was enabled that people were able to connect with resources. We got almost there social workers who were able to find clients on a regular basis because unfortunately with many small spread out shelters it's too hard to often find someone because they need to get into a bed when that was all under solar marina that was effective we did see people getting into resources connecting to vouchers getting into housing i also support the fact that the line is going to be a housing solution as opposed to a low, I forget the term for it, but low barrier, low barrier shelter. Sullivan as an emergency shelter. It gets really, really cold here. I'm shocked, frankly, still, after a couple years living here, at it's a state that's beautiful and I can kill you. And the Sullivan area has a solution at this point, but winter is coming. And it's already here. I'm very much worried about every citizen of Anchorage, all of the human beings that live with us in this community that might be experiencing a tough time right now, especially after COVID. The communities around Sullivan absolutely have my sympathy. Honestly, I absolutely drive through it for work. I can also recognize that the past two years were very, very special. It was a global pandemic. There were a lot of things that we had to do that we weren't able to plan the way we wanted to plan. And I do believe that the administration and the assembly is very responsive and can absolutely come up with some of the things that the, the community is asking for for mitigation and a way to balance the needs of everyone. Because we all, we're all lessons. So I thank you all for your participation. Thank you. Before we continue, I just want to do a quick time check. So I see um, two individuals in line. Um, I just want to double check. Are there any other individuals who can't attend Monday and speak tomorrow at our special assembly meeting? It's currently scheduled from 6 to 8 p.m. today. Um, who would like to speak today? Just want to make sure. Okay, so then um, what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna hear from these two individuals, then we are going to open it up to uh, final audience participation, because I have to do that. 
And then um, we are going to uh, have some closing thoughts or comments from the mayor and then any other assembly members who would like to do that. And then we will close. I think we can get that all done in, I don't know, 10 minutes, I hope. Um, so I will go ahead and ask a, for a motion to extend by the 10 minutes. So Any opposition? Okay, we're extended until 3.40. Welcome. Hello. Uh, <laughs> My name's uh, Michael Patterson. I lived in the North Star Community Council area, so North Anchorage. And I just really want to say, just from the beginning, that I think what's missing in these conversations a lot is that housing is a human right. You have to have housing. It is a very basic need for everyone who is alive that you have to have shelter. You have to have it. There's no alternative to housing. The only alternative to housing is being homeless. It's just like water, it's just like air. You have to have it to survive. You have to have it to be a well-functioning member of society. And so what I think is getting lost in these conversations a lot is that we're talking about people, we're talking about human beings, you know? And I think the reason why we're here and why there's so many different communities, the hockey community, the neighborhood in that community, uh, where Gold Line is, around Sullivan, is that, frankly, the city for decades has failed to solve homelessness. And it's not, it's not something that is unsolvable. It's not a mystery. You have to give people homes. You have to give them real homes. Not, like, I'm not a fan of concrete areas. I'm just to take this off. I'm not a fan of concrete areas because it's just not, nobody wants to live like that. Nobody wants to be packed into an a, a ice hockey rink or a, a, an arena because what does that say to that person? Oh, I'm just, I'm just uh, a number. I'm just a statistic. I'm just something to be packed away, to be shoved out of the, out of the public view. And so, I think fundamentally, we have to give people homes. And, and I think we have to have this premise that housing is human right, and the city, the government, is responsible for providing that to people because housing is a public utility. Just like I, the first uh, meeting that the mayor had about the math center, is that you know he said. If you have a heart attack, you expect the firefighters or paramedics to show up. If you have a public safety issue, you expect the police to show up. That is a right. It is a right to be housed. And I think we need to have start having that conversation more. And you know, and I would just say in terms of this plan, it's the only plan. There's no choice. We have to do this because there's nothing else. And so it, it, it just it's mind-boggling to me that we can talk about people like this and be like, you know, my property value is going to go down. Or, you know, and I see what with the kids because I was an athlete in high school too, and it caught, it kept me out of all the trouble, but it kept me out of enough trouble to do enough to not, you know, ruin my life. We have to stop putting the burden on kids. We have to stop putting the burden on regular working class people. The city needs to provide housing. You just need to do it. If we have to, and you know, I, I've lived in areas all over Anchorage where I've had people sleeping in my stairwell, I've had people sleeping in, in cardboards, I've seen people as a kid, you know, digging for garbage. As a parent of a six year old or a seven year old, it pains me that I have to explain to my son why there's people on the streets who are hungry. When we are one of the wealthiest states in the country, because of, and none of that wealth is spent on people. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Sarah Shore, and I live in the district presided over by Mr. Perez Verdia. And I have to say that I feel extremely qualified to speak in this matter on homelessness. Not only have I been homeless, but I have a daughter who's currently homeless. What you guys are failing to address is the reasons these people are homeless. We're sending out packets of the narcotics recovery stuff and we made a bunch of habits. How sad is that? How sad is it that we are going to address it late when we're going to try and bring them out of it? Why can't we start putting together programs and housing and getting these people off the street that are actually working towards addiction recovery? I saw something in writing signed by Meg Zalatel that promised that the Golden Lion was going to be a treatment center. And I am pissed off to the max that I have to drive by these addicts on the street. 
that you never know if they're dead or alive. I don't know how many times I've stopped to help somebody, not knowing whether or not they're dead or alive. Not knowing if it's my daughter. Foundation, a nonprofit arm of a for-profit corporation, 
failing to deliver basic services? My sin is failing me. I can relate to the woman before me. My heart goes after her. And my prayers to you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so then I'll go ahead and conclude final audience participation. So we're going to go ahead and move on with the four minutes we have left. I uh, want to go to the mayor see if he has um, anything that he'd like to address uh, to the committee and the public. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Rivera. Uh, I just want to thank the committee uh, for the great work and the assembly for hosting this meeting here today. I think it's uh, been uh, very productive. And uh, it's a good chance, I think, for all of us to listen to what the public has to say, whether it's hockey or homeless or, or whatever, and, and as they intersect. So, again, thank you very much for hosting this meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll go ahead and turn to any committee members who'd like to speak. Mr. Constant. Thank you. There was just one thing that I have to speak to. Um, one of the individuals suggested that we should have some facilities in my neighborhood. And um, I want folks to understand the nature of service delivery in the north part of Anchorage, in particular in the downtown district. And it's not just emergency shelter, because that's just one part of the system of services. And this list is not complete. But in my district, we have the Cordova Center, the Guest House, the Brother Grants and Shelter, the Carla Grant, the Parkway Center, Governor House, Avery Hotel, Downtown Hope Center, the way we have the Sullivan that served in its capacity, we have the Sockeye Inn. We have so many of these, 325, 3rd Avenue, they're all over my district. And so I just want folks to know that I understand what it needs to have services to support our neighbors in my neighborhood. Thank you. Mr. Salt? So we agree. So we are where we are. I don't, I'm not looking backwards. Let's just, as a body, the assembly, the administration, let's execute. Let's get these facilities on the market. Let's get the homeless off the street and the place for this printer. And then let's look at, we heard several people say, we're not addressing the root cause of this problem. We have liquor stores that are selling willingly, knowingly, to a degree. We have drug dealers that get off the slats. And some of these are state issues. But we need, I mean, you want me to solve drug issues? I can solve them tomorrow. You deal drugs, you're dead. You're executed. Countries do that. It's harsh, it's cold, I get it. But it'll solve it tomorrow. Okay? We're not that kind of society. We're not going to go to those extremes. But it can be done. We need to find the right balance to then attack the root causes before we're picking people up off the street. Let's keep the people in the home they have today before they lose that. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there's much to be said, but I'll just keep going to a few comments. First off, thank you to the task force for putting together this list and for coming up with some possibilities in a very short amount of time. I recognize you all our volunteers, and that was not an easy task, so thank you. Thank you to the members of the public who have come here today to speak and to be a part of this conversation and to recognize that this is a very, it's a complicated issue. So thank you for that. I want to note that. Mr. Prince, actually, sorry. Sorry to interrupt you for that, but I do need an extension before the committee ends. So just a couple Sure. We don't have any five seconds. Five seconds. Okay. Any opposition? Okay, thanks. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to be clear, too, that the proposal that we're looking at is to use the Golden Lion as housing and not shelter. And you all recall that when the Golden Lion was purchased as part of the MLMP sale, so that could move forward on the basis it would be used as a treatment center, there were those terms that it would not be used for homeless and transient shelter. And when uh, Chair Rivera went over some of the terms early on, Congregant, congregant shelter versus housing. It is really, really important to recognize again this is for housing and not shelter, and that's very different. Um, I also wanted to note too that churches tend to house families and they do a really great job of it. But oftentimes, folks who have complex behavioral needs are not a great fit for churches. 
And so there is a limit to the capacity of those kinds of approaches, so they're so critical to helping to shelter folks. And then finally, too, um, I recognize that the Sullivan is, um, that's a difficult piece of the conversation, and that at one point it was operating as a very, a, as a very, very large shelter. And in this situation, it would not be for any more than 150 people. I'm not saying that's necessarily the right situation, but I think it definitely shows that when we have these very big shelters, low barrier shelters, where there are minimum requirements for people to get a place to stay, that the bigger they are, the more difficult they are to manage and the greater impact on the neighborhood. So again, thank you all so very much for being here today, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah. Thank you. I think Mr. Lawrence actually said everything that I was going to say. So I appreciate that and appreciate everyone coming out today to, to, to share your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm not seeing anyone else who wants to. Uh, Mr. Golden. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you for everyone for uh, attending this meeting and making your voices heard. Um, you know, it does strike me that the options are so limited. We're not choosing. We're not making easy choices between good options. We're having to make really tough choices between really hard options. Um, you know, I, I just do want to say that I, I don't support using um, the hockey facilities, uh, MC and Loki, and um, I think we really need to be carefully about uh, quality of life and health in our community. It's also why I've, I've sponsored um, in order to so would, would make it tougher to use the rec centers. Um, you know, to echo uh, Mr. Constant, fellow assembly member for our Anchorage, it's a really tough decision to put people back in the Sullivan. And there was someone who testified and said that felt like a step back. And I just want to hear everyone in my community here that I agree with that. It does feel like a step back. Um, and I do hope going forward that as a couple of the speakers today from the Fairview neighborhood recommended that we as a body could do something to help with mitigation, with public safety, with cleanup. Uh, Ms. Walton, who, who isn't here anymore, um, she, she spoke today, and she, I know that she's been dealing with that I think seven different times now. Um, so that community is really struggling and, and trying really hard to um, do what they can as engaged citizens to take the initiative themselves. I just want to give you some support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. All right, with that, I think you all have heard enough from me. I will have much more to share tomorrow. Uh, with that, I invite everyone, I want to thank everyone for attending today. I invite you all to come back tomorrow during our special meeting from 6 to 8 p.m. And this meeting is adjourned.